As we all know, atrial fibrillation is tremendously common and its burden will continue to grow. And options for rhythm control, maintaining sinus rhythm are becoming more and more common as opposed to just controlling the rate of patients in atrial fibrillation based on a number of recent studies that have come out as well as ones that are ongoing. My name is Dr. Christopher DeSimone. I'm a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist and associate professor here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And I'm pleased to present highlights on an upcoming review article in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. The title of this review is Antiarrhythmic Drugs for Atrial Fibrillation in the Outpatient Setting, the Common Clinical Scenarios and Pearls for the Primary Care Clinician, co-authored by my colleagues, Dr. Andrew Sang and Dr. Guru Kolgi. As primary care providers, being the first point of contact and where these issues are found based on EKG and symptoms from the patients, it's important that patients are picked up on early as our interventions such as drug therapy or ablations will be more effective earlier on in the disease state. And it's very important to have a good grasp on antiarrhythmic drugs, their mechanisms of action, their interactions with other drugs being prescribed for a multitude of comorbidities. And given these are antiarrhythmic drugs, the coin flip side of this is that they're also proarrhythmic and they could cause other undue side effects. In this review, we use case-based vignettes to highlight clinical pearls and we summarize key facts between class one sodium channel blockers as well as class three potassium channel blockers, for example. This includes summary tables such as table two, which looks at key points and summaries for sodium channel blockers, the class 1C agents. These are use-dependent agents, meaning they have more potent side effects and efficacy at higher heart rates. Thus, when we test for these prorhythmic effects to be safe, these are done in states where we mimic fast heart rates, such as which occurs with exercise, and thus the reason and rationale behind getting an exercise treadmill test within the first one to two weeks after starting such an agent. Also, given that these drugs block sodium channels, they slow down conduction in the heart, and we avoid these in patients with structural heart disease, such as those that have suffered prior heart attacks and have scar in the heart, inducible ischemia or lack of blood flow to the heart, or in patients with hypertrophy of the heart, such as those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We provide helpful hints as well, such as pres prescribing low-dose beta blockers or calcium channel blockers in order to prevent atrial fibrillation from organizing into a more dangerous situation, being rapidly conducted atrial flutter into a one-to-one -one atrial to ventricular manner. Another exemplary table is where we discuss the important principles for the class three blocking agents. So here we compare and contrast to make the, re the reader more facile with these drugs and understanding of the mechanism of interaction as well as how to monitor. So by comparing and contrasting with our class one agents, we hope this affords easier understanding and more fluency with these agents. Now, potassium channel blockers in the reverse compared to our sodium channel blockers are reverse use dependent, meaning these bind at the closed state channel. These are more efficacious and more potent at slower heart rates, and thus our stress test is during sleep or when the heart rate slow during bradycardia. This is when side effects are most likely to manifest. For example, one way to add caution, and these drugs would be started in the hospital, would be a reduction or elimination of beta blockade or calcium channel blockers to avoid such interactions. When you see a patient in the outpatient clinic and you are planning on having them sent to a cardiologist or electrophysiologist for initiation of these drugs, or if you're seeing a patient that's on one of these class three agents, note that reducing beta blockade or lower heart rates could be life-saving or avoiding complications for your patients. We also touch on keeping meticulous attention to the ECG, especially the QTC interval, and avoiding low potassium and low magnesium states, which can occur with common things such as diuretic use, which many of your patients will be on. And finally, we kind of put a framework in of guidelines about how to take patients on drugs, when patients fail drugs, when patients need catheter ablation on top of this, and who would be good candidates. 
Well, we know sometimes our antiarrhythmic agents do not work as effectively as we hope, or patients have breakthrough atrial fibrillation episodes on this. And thus, catheter ablation would be recommended in addition or in lieu of an antiarrhythmic agent. And it's critical that we convey to our patients antiarrhythmic agents or catheter ablation is used for improvement of symptoms as well as improvement in quality of life. Now that said, certain patients based on recent studies stand to gain significant benefit from maintenance of sinus rhythm as opposed to being atrial fibrillation, especially our patients that have heart failure or reduced ejection fractions. And if they're felt to suffer from atrial fibrillation causing the heart failure itself. In addition, we talk about when it's prudent to use antiarrhythmics if they're not tolerated or if someone has kidney or liver disease and how to monitor these or if they're preclusive in those states. I hope you find this brief overview intriguing and I really hope you find our Mayo Clinic review article very instructive, formulative, and hoping to open up that dialogue so that our primary care physicians who are on the front line and who will be keeping our patients safe, as well as sending patients who need escalation of care, will improve their quality of care, quality of life, and make everybody more comfortable with the use of these agents. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.